Just send me a dime. We'll just send you some food. You answer prayer. You answer prayer. You answer prayer. You answer prayer. You are so good to me. Good job, y'all. Thank you so much. Yeah. Y'all sound good talking about a choir, brother Robert. You got a choir. Everybody. Well, if you want to be turning, if you, if you have your Bibles, let's meet in 1 Kings chapter 11. To quote the songwriter, every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before because we love him more and more. And every follower of Christ should be able to say that, especially those who've had the benefit of many years of walking with him like most of us have. King Solomon spoiled an extraordinary life by turning from God in his latter years. In a way, it's such a tragedy. But what God can do is bring good out of that and teach us some things, some things to watch out for, so that as we grow older, God willing, then we will be able to, to, to be wise enough to hopefully steer away from whatever it might be and instead focus on our Lord. So 1 Kings chapter 11 if you are able to, if you're not, it's fine. I'd like to invite you to stand with me in reverence to the reading of this portion of Scripture. 1 Kings chapter 11. Let's go down and we'll pick up verse 4 right now. Verse 4. For it was so when Solomon was old that his wives turned his heart after other gods and his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God as was the heart of his father David. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and did not fully follow the Lord, as did his father David. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, on the hill that is east of Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the people of Ammon. Verse 8, And he did likewise for all his foreign wives who burned incense and sacrifice to their gods. So the Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned from the Lord God of Israel who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he did not keep what the Lord had commanded. Therefore the Lord said to Solomon, because you've done this and have not kept my covenant and my statutes which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. Nevertheless, I will not do it in your days for the sake of your father David. I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away the whole kingdom. I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. Thank you so much, dear sweet people, and please be seated. What would cause someone, to, kind of a rhetorical question, but if you feel led to respond, that's fine. But what would cause someone to quit on the home stretch of, of life? And we've seen that. We all have. Somebody that walked with God and seemed to be so faithful and so in love with God, and then they get toward the end of life, still have the health to do some things and serve and pray and, and, and so forth, but just, I don't like some people saying, turn south and, and putting down us southerners. You know, people say that, they'll say, Boy, it's going south in, in a bad way. How about this? It's going north. <laughs> oh, man, you can see the old southern boy coming out. But anyway, I had some friends with working with the service that always said, Riley, we're going to have to get you up here and do something with your accent. They were from up north, and, and uh, I said, well, how about this? Have you ever thought that you guys are the ones with the accent? But... We're talking about, in this case, as you know, y'all could be teaching this just like I could. We're talking about a man who basically had it all. He, he had all that a person you would think would want and need, and then some. Let's go back and be reminded of what, it, what we're talking about in chapter 10. Let's begin in verse 1. Now, when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to test him with hard questions. She came to Jerusalem with a very great retinue, with camels that bore spices, very much gold and precious stones. And when she came to Solomon, 
She spoke with him about all that was in her heart. So Solomon answered all her questions. There was nothing so difficult for the king that he could not explain it to her. And when the queen of Sheba, goddess of the Sidonians, let's see, wait a minute, I'll make sure I'm telling you all right here. No, I got messed up there. Let me see what I'm doing here. And when the queen of Sheba had seen all the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the food on his table, the seating of his servants, the service of his waiters and their apparel, his cupbearers and his entryway by which he went up to the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. In other words, she's just, she's blown away by this. Verse 6, then she said to the king, it was a true report which I heard in my own land about your words and your wisdom. However, I did not believe the words until I came and saw with my own eyes, and indeed the half has not been told me. Your wisdom and prosperity exceed the fame of which I heard. Now verses 23 and 4. So King Solomon surpassed all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom. Now all the earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put in his heart. All right. The nation of Israel had reached its heyday to become the most powerful nation on earth at this time. This was the time when the nation of Israel on land much extended, extended much further up to the north and south along the Mediterranean Sea and back to the east, modern day Jordan and on the cross as we have today. You can look at some of the maps of that time with the reign of Solomon as it was peaking and it was a huge empire. And the crowning achievement of Solomon's 40-year reign was the building of the sacred temple, renowned as one of the ancient wonders of the world. For much of his life, Solomon was a good man. We could say that Solomon was a, was a godly man. And that's what makes it all the more tragic. It's, it's so sad when you see something like this. Uh, and you see it, when, for example, when a husband walks out on his wife of many years, and you think, what in the world? And I don't put people down who've gone through divorce. I would have never thought we would have had both of our sons go through divorce. I guess the only good thing I can see in that is it's just giving me a softer heart for divorcees and trying to minister to and serve them. It happens to good and godly people. But still yet, when you, when you look at that and, and, and think of some, some examples of how it can, it can go. It could, it could very well be a, uh, a deacon or a Sunday school teacher drops out of church. It could be a minister who falls morally only to forfeit essentially everything that they'd worked so hard to, to attain. And let this be a clear reminder to us, beloved, because sometimes we can, you know, but for the grace of God, we, can, we could all be, be somewhere other than here tonight, right? We really could. And finishing poorly in the latter years of our race ruins even the best of lives. It seems the older Solomon became, the less he used his God-given wisdom. He had the wisdom. He knew better. And yet I think of myself and things I've done, and I knew better. I maybe didn't have the wisdom, but I knew better. The Spirit was convicting me not to go in a certain direction or do something. But think about your walk with Christ. Is it, is it closer today than it's ever been? And then if not, why not? And don't, don't answer that out loud unless you just want to. Just think about that. If it's not where it needs to be, why isn't it? And so I pray that the more we age, the more we'll want to please Jesus Christ. There is hope tonight. There's always hope. And that's what, that's what we're going to be getting into as well. And so um, I took our message title, When Solomon Was Old, as you saw directly from our text. It's straight out of the text. It introduces our first truth, and that's this. Many of us are already rounding third base. I'm going to put it in softball, baseball terms. Uh, many of us are already rounding third base. Picture a ball diamond with me. If the median life expectancy of is, is let's say, uh, if the average life expectancy 
is 80 years. And that's about where it is. You know, the Bible talks about that three score and 10 for some four score. That's about where we're at today, pretty much. Daddy was 87 when God called him home, and Mama was 75, I think. And so it hasn't changed that much. So anyway, let's, let's take it from that point. You can argue a little bit if you want around that, but it's about, let's just take the average life expectancy is 80 years old. Then first base represents 20 years, second base is halfway, second base 40 years, third base is 60 years, and 80 would be home. You know, are we with me? You with me on that? Okay. We could say those in their 80s plus are living what my aunt always has been calling for recent years, bonus years. And uh, the Bible says in, in, in verse 4a that, for it was so when Solomon was old. Now, some of us may not like to think of ourselves as old. Um, but the truth is the truth. You're not just old as old as you feel. You're as old as you are. Does that make sense? Y'all okay? <laughs> Hang with me. Do what I am. <laughs> well, God loves us. Every day is a gift, isn't it? I think the older we get, the more we appreciate life. Because it's so fleeting. I used to hear the older folks talk about... Wait till you get older. Time's going to speed up. Well, now I'm one of them, 72. And I tell you what, it seemed like it was just Christmas just a month ago, and here it is going into March. Shucks, we'll be eating tomato sandwiches next week. <laughs> <laughs> but though we're, we're not certain exactly how old Solomon was, and, and I've just found this out and going back over this text again for you tonight, I, I, thought, I would have thought this that he was older than what he really was. Let me go ahead with my thought. We're not certain exactly how old Solomon was when he died. By the way, remember there's a difference in your Bible in the text and the commentary. Okay? Commentaries can be helpful, instructive, and give us some food for thought, but commentaries are commentators. Common commentaries. Good night. I'm thinking about sweet potatoes and mashed potatoes, I reckon. But any, anyway, um, that's what they are. They're somebody's opinion. But, but the, the, the prevailing mindset is, well, first of all, Scripture tells us that he reigned 40 years, okay? And it's generally agreed that he was about 20 when he became king. So he only lived to be about 60 when he died. I say only. 60 young, isn't it? Oh, and the 60 young... No, I don't want to get you in trouble, son. That's all right. You're doing a great job. Um, but, but 60 doesn't sound old at all to me. 80 doesn't sound that old to me anymore. Miss Ruth, we keep going. We're going to pass you and how old something seems. And so those in their 30s and 40s don't like to think of themselves as middle age. Somebody 35, 40, 45 years old, they consider themselves to be middle age. But, but you're not. And, and so do the math. The, the, the Bible says that three score and ten for some four score. So two times 40 would, would be 80. And so some uh, uh, of those that, that are in their 50s and 60s are not middle age Because if you multiply theirs out and, and do, just simply double it, um, someone that's in their 50s and 60s, I, I just don't know many people that live to be 100 to 120 years old, do y'all? So they're not middle-aged. If they're in their 50s and 60s, they're seniors. And so we just tell them, cheer up, it's okay. It's all right. I had a, a dear brother ask me, um, see, I call them if they're, if they're over 80, let's say, that's a certain category, the 70 to 80, that's, a, that's about average. But anyway, he asked me, he said, and, and it's a little coin that I've used the phrase, there are super seniors. So there's seniors and then there's super seniors. And so somebody, one of our deacons at a previous church asked me when I was talking about that one time, he said, well, Pastor Mike, how old do you have to be to be a super senior? And I said, I'll let you figure that out. I'm not going to touch you on that. But I've never made a big deal out of birthdays or given it too much thought until more recently. 
since I have been in my 70s, it's, it's hit me that I've already rounded third base and I'm headed for home. In fact, I'm a little bit more than halfway between third and home plate, home base. And um, of course, the moment we start heading for first, really and truly, oh, and this applies to you as well, because ultimately the goal is to get home, no shortcuts. I was sharing this morning at church about Chris's peewee ball, ball team and uh, how that some of those little ones, when they're first starting out, they'll get to first and then they're like, why go all the way over there at that bag when I can cut across this mound and be right over there at third base a lot quicker? <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, a number of us are already rounding third base, but that's not a bad thing, beloved. That's not a curse. That's a blessing. That's a praise. Third base is not our final destination. Heaven is. What could be better? So how do we get there? Truth number two. We trust the third base coach to get us home. Often the, the first base coach will be one of his assistants. Spiritually, you could think of parents, teachers, pastors, and other leaders. But they all get their instructions from the head coach who's out there coaching third base or even in the dugout. He's coaching. He's the one in charge. Who are we talking about, church? That's right. Jesus. That's right. And so... Yes, none other than the Lord Jesus. And if he says, tag up, you better tag up. If he says, go, you give it everything you've got and you go. You and I are not the head coach. Jesus Christ is. Anytime a team member thinks he or she's smarter than the Lord, they're headed for disaster. And that was Solomon's problem. Verse 2, back in, in let's see, chapter 11, verse 2. From the nations of whom the Lord has said to the children of Israel, you shall not intermarry with them, nor with they with you. Surely they will turn away your hearts after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. If only he had, we had read, and we, we could change it, we're not going to. And it said that Solomon took God seriously at his word. But if asked, are you smarter than God, hopefully every sane person here would say, no way, no way, no. And yet, if we, if we read or hear his word and choose to ignore it, aren't we making the very same mistake that Solomon made? Are we really any different than the way he was? I think sometimes we get a little hard on him and maybe too easy on ourselves. Let's go back and read verses 4 through 8 with this idea in mind here that we, we got to trust the coach and do what he tells us. Verse 4, so it was when Solomon was old, there's our title by the way, that his wives turned his heart after other gods and his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God as was the heart of his father David. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and did not fully follow the Lord as his father, as did his father David. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, on the hill that is east of Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the people of Ammon. And he did likewise for all his foreign wives who burned incense and sacrificed their God. So, Multiple marriages were primarily political in nature. I mean, to build foreign alliances, that's what he, the excuse he, he was probably thinking in his own mind. But over time, Solomon became attached to these women and eventually to their religions, or at least some of them. And you know, the Bible, people have asked me, well, doesn't the Bible seem to endorse and pretty strongly polygamy and, and slavery, for example? And no, it doesn't. The Bible doesn't do that at all. It doesn't promote those things. It, 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 it speaks to them because it was a part of life in that day, but it doesn't say you need to go out and get you a bunch of wives or husbands. Think about it. Go all the way back. How many wives did God give Adam? One. One. Moses had warned of, of the no, no king that he warned that no king of Israel was to multiply wives for himself. He specifically, God gave him word of instruction for this time in Solomon's life. And he, of course, 
At the time, I'm sure Moses wouldn't have even known it. But Solomon ignored it. And perhaps it went something like this. Honey, you built that grand and glorious temple years ago to your God. When are you going to set up high places for me to worship my God too? And ladies, I'm not picking on you. You know, men can talk the same way. Same accent. But how about you and me? Are we ignoring something God has told us? Are we even trying to learn more about what he has said? Let's go back to baseball. The coach expects his players to, to learn his signs. And one reason I think there seems to me there's a lot poorer base running now these days than there used to be. I, I think it's because that the, the, some on the team maybe feel like they're above the, the, the team meetings and three or four a week usually. And they, in their minds, they're already good enough. They don't need to do it to meet with the team. They'll just skip out on one or two of them instead of going to them. But Hebrews 10.25 tells us that that's when we compare notes from the coach for our game plan, is when we come together for our team meetings like this, is a team meeting, if you will. And the Acts 2 church understood that God blessed that kind of commitment to the body, to the church. It's much like how you, how, it's just a basic thing that, that you know, you, you do well in college, for example, as we send off our, our kids and, and grandkids. Boy, I tell you, y'all, we really need to be praying about some of these schools that some of our young people are going to and contaminating the minds of these young people. So liberal, ultra radical leftists. And anyway, um, it's, it's much like how we, do, how we do well in college. We attend class, it's real simple. We attend class, we pay attention, and we develop good study habits. That's what you do. It's not complicated, but it requires effort. I wasn't that as smart, and y'all figured that out pretty quick. We were with you, blessed to be with you seven years, but I'm not, I wasn't that smart, but in college I made better grades than most did because I worked so hard. I worked at it. I knew my limitations were there. I couldn't just get by and study a little bit and, and hope to pass it. Besides, I wanted to do better than just pass it. And above all, God gets all the glory for that. In Luke eleven twenty eight, 28, our Lord Jesus said, Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. King Solomon started out doing what, doing what he's supposed to do, and, and God blessed it. God loves to bless obedience. But he cannot be expected to bless disobedience. Who do we think we're talking to sometimes? And so you, you can trace Solomon's slow fade. Let's call it that. Back to chapter 11, verse 1. But King Solomon loved many foreign women, as well as the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. So how about you and how about me? Is there a sin where, where we might be saying, I know what the Bible says, but this is a different day. God understands. And need I remind you and remind me, if Solomon, the wisest man, could fall, where does that leave you and me? It doesn't have to be polygamy to get you out, to keep you from scoring and getting, getting in home. It could be something else. Tragically, Solomon began to believe he could do as he pleased without the coach. And by failing to score, he betrayed his people at the worst possible time, which takes us to life lesson number three. Why is it that we seem to be able to handle poverty better than, and, and, and adversity better than good times, plenty? Seems like we can't, we can't handle uh, uh, blessings of God very well. He blesses, and then lo and behold, we go off and do something stupid, just like the children of Israel. God will judge them, they come back, we're sorry, God bless them, give them another chance. When are we going to learn that God is God and he wants to see us stay the course and finish strong? Like Paul said, I've finished the race, I've kept the faith, and he was, he was killed soon after 2 Timothy. That was some of his last writings God gave him. 
And he was ready. He was like, bring it on. I'm ready. Let's roll. As the guy said over Pennsylvania, what, 911? Let's roll. So number three, you can't score till you cross home plate. Some people think because of what they've done in the past, it's enough brownie points, a good enough batting average or whatever, that's going to get them special favor. No, the most important part of a race is the home stretch. And let that encourage those of you who feel so bad about maybe you're, you're still honing and carrying guilt over some things you did as a young adult. God forgives. And you can, you can, the home stretch, like I say, is the, is the most important part, even more important than back then. I mean, think about it. What have you accomplished if you run the bases well, but you get trapped between third and home because you ignored the third base coach uh, and hesitated just enough that they got you out if you went like he's telling you to go? And so, dear one, we, we can't ever stop listening to God regardless of how old we get. What good is the God-given wisdom of years if we don't use it, if we stop studying God's Word, if we stop praying, if we stop serving, if we stop witnessing like we should? By the end of his life, Solomon had broken most of the Proverbs God had given him to write. Solomon's wisdom didn't fail him. He failed to follow it. And that's because where the fear of God disappears, wisdom dies. And God had given him that great pre preface to uh, the Proverbs that the fear is the, be the beginning of wisdom. The fear of God, the respect of God, the, 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 the awe of, of, of God is what, what happens with that. And so the fear of God disappeared. And we need to remember God has feelings. Y'all believe that? God has feelings. God actually weeps. Go back and do a study sometime on the times God cried. Amazing. Look at the times Jesus wept. But anyhow, let's go to chapter verses 9 and 10. So the Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned from the Lord God of Israel who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods but he did not keep what the Lord had commanded. And so, dear people, we don't ever want God to become angry with us. Solomon was so close to scoring, and yet so far. He didn't, he didn't just run out of, out of the baseline rounding third. He ran slam jam off the field and messed up on the home stretch. I wasn't a very good baseball player. My, my forte was basketball, and as I got older, some softball and a little bit of golf. But golf's real unpredictable, though. So I, I can come home playing golf, and Sue can tell if I had a good round or not. So why do you keep putting yourself through that drudgery? No, she didn't say that. I said that. I asked myself, what am I doing out here? But basketball was my, my first love in sports. But anyway, I played a little bit of baseball. I was playing on a Pony League team. And we were playing against the best pitcher in the league. <clears throat> Nobody hardly ever got very many hits off of that guy. And so it was my time to bat. I couldn't even hardly get a hit for, from the ones that weren't so good. But I just kind of almost swung with my, I don't know why I'm going up here. <laughs> but anyway, I swung and I nailed it. Nailed it. And I thought, that thing's out of here. And what it was, it was a wall back way out in the outfield, and I thought, sure, it had gone over the wall. But it had not. And so even as early as from going from second to third, I'd already gone into the rooster strut. You know how it used to be when you knock one over, you just kind of... <laughs> anyway, so I was going off, and the third base coach, I think it was my daddy, said, run, Mike, run. I was like, I want to enjoy this moment. That guy's the best pitcher in the league. And so... Because like I said, I wasn't very good at it. It was a miracle I got it hit. They got me out, and I just barely got off third base, and, <laughs> and they nailed me, you know, <laughs> put me out. I was like, where in the world did that ball come from? Oh, me. You know, God will humble us, morning, And that's a good thing. I, I, he'll, he'll get these old long legs of mine knocked out from under me every time because he loves me too much to let me self-destruct. 
The truth is none of us know how much longer we have at, at anything. But dear brothers and sisters in Christ, let's all keep reminding each other, other we've gone too far to quit now. Let's don't quit now. If anything, let's, let's pick it up. We're not home yet. You can't score till you cross home plate. Can you imagine what it would be like to have that great cloud of witnesses congratulate you as you cross home plate? Hallelujah, praise the Lord. And then above everything else, you can see him standing there in all of his glory. Oh, I'm, I can only imagine as the song goes, what will I do? Will I even be able to speak, say anything for a thousand years, just all? The angels still haven't gotten over being with him all the eon of time. Even before time began, he already was. And just going up to him and hearing him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I don't know if I'll hear that or not, but I'm, I'm probably just so thankful to make it in. If, even if I have to slide into home base, but I'm, uh, I, I'm, I know that he can be pleased. That's the thing. Not, because, not by our perfection, but by knowing where our completeness comes from. You see, your run counting is, is not about you. My run, if I score, my, it's not about me. It's, it's about the, the team, and above all, it's about the coach. The one that all of heaven is saying worthy of all honor and glory and power to the King of kings and Lord of lords. To the one who sits on the throne, the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, truth number four. Your team is counting on you to score. Your team is counting on you to score. And so to our younger adults of the church family, Step up and let's don't hold back. Let's don't hold back. I know we, you know, I look at things and I think, where are a lot of our churches today? And, and you, you, you're blessed. We are blessed. Y'all still let us call this home. And it is our home. We need a home base. But um, you have a, a lot better age distribution than most churches do. Um, some churches you look at, it's, kind of, it's really quite sad because you don't, you don't have, oh, and there wouldn't be anybody your age and some that we've been to. And so where would that church, where is that church going to be in 10 or 20 years? You need to think about those things. Will there even be a Sunday night service? Will there even be a Wednesday night service? Will there be a Sunday school? Will there be a brotherhood, a WMU? With the way things are, I'm talking about right now in these churches. That, and so I, don't, I try real hard not to ever beat anybody up. But if anything, I want to be the one jumping up down, hollering and encouraging, don't quit. I know you're discouraged maybe, but keep on pouring it on. God's going to be honored by how we finish the race. And so most of us have passed third base. If you don't agree with that, then that's all right. Um, you wouldn't be right, though, but it'd be all right if this way. <laughs> all right, verse 4 again. For it was so when Solomon was old that his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God as was the heart of his father David. To our seniors and super seniors, we've come too far to sputter now. Solomon got off to a great start, but that can only take you so far. We must continue to press toward the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Rather than repent when he was rebuked, like his father David, when he, when he did, you know, King David, when Nathan came to him, um, he, he, he was the man of God after God's own heart by the way he dealt with Nathan. And, and he didn't, he could have had him kill him, get him out of my court. But when Nathan confronted him with the truth of Bathsheba, David was convicted and said, you're right. I've sinned. That's what made him a man after God's own heart. He wasn't perfect either, but he never forgot where to go to for grace. And look at how God used him. Yes, his family paid a tremendous price. But look at how God used him from his brokenness to give us some of the most beautiful scripture 
you can ever want to find in, in God's library of 66 books in the Psalms. I mean, you know, in his brokenness, God used even that. So Solomon continued physicaling out the older he got. And like I say, it not only cost him, it cost his family, it cost his congregation, it cost his nation. His nation collapsed. And they never got over it. That's how important these eternal principles are. Hebrews 10.31 warns us that it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God when he's angry. God has feelings. Verses 11 through 13 as we finish up this passage. Therefore the Lord said to Solomon, Because you've done this and have not kept my covenant and my statutes which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. Nevertheless, I will not do it in your days for the sake of your father David. I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away the whole kingdom. I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. So Solomon was severely disciplined for refusing to heed God's word and to, to repent. God didn't immediately take away Solomon's wealth, Solomon's knowledge, um, and, but he did do something even dr more dramatic. God took away, and, and it, I don't know how it could be any harder trying to teach him a lesson, God took away his ability to be able to enjoy these things. He could no longer enjoy all this stuff. God gives us all things richly to enjoy. Now, we don't hoard it to ourselves. We always look for ways to share. But he could have, just think what he could have done if he'd have handled that, those resources right. And so God took that away. Go back and look at Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes was written after his fall, I do believe. I could be wrong, but I believe it was because so much of Ecclesiastes is where I believe the writer is Solomon, inspired writer, where he said, look, I've had it all. I've had the wine, the women, the wealth, the riches. I've had everything, and I'm telling you, it's like chasing the wind. It's vanity. It's nothing. And he goes through that incredible book, and at the end he says, here's the conclusion of everything I've said. I'm paraphrasing. He said, fear God and keep his commandments. That's what I've learned, he's telling us. So when Solomon died, the kingdom was literally torn to pieces because the wisest man in all the world quit before he scored. And so, dear one, your commitment to God's team efforts, it, 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 those efforts affects everybody associated with you. Your commitment is going to affect your family, church, friends, community, and beyond. They all deserve our very best. After all, isn't that what our coach gave us at Calvary? That's what he did. He set the example. And then some. Well, I hope you, regardless of your age, will see that if you're old enough to be saved, you're old enough to, to know better and to take these truths to, to heart. This invitation is for everybody. You, you, you can't um, take a, a year off from serving God um, life's a vapor pause for just a minute and see if you can feel the next heartbeat or think of it you realize we're only one heartbeat away right there just as quick as that one heartbeat away from either going to heaven or to hell we've got to be ready we've got to be ready I was reminded of the example of Ms. Bertha Smith, Sue, and a missionary uh, to China for 40 years. And in her 90s, she came back to the States, not to retire, but to continue going wherever she could to promote missions. And here we are right now, the Annie Armstrong uh, Easter emphasis time. And she would faithfully go wherever she could, anybody that would open the doors to her. And Sue and I had the privilege to hear her speak in person. It just packed out at this little church there that we were at. But now get this. In her 90s, she scheduled speaking engagements on through to when she would be 105. 
<laughs> and I don't know if she actually made it to that or not, but she was, she was going to be ready. She went ahead and she let them know, now this depends on God. And, and they were like, sure, but we, well, let's go for it. And, and I don't know, but I realize you, you may not be able to travel with me either when you're 95 like Miss Bertha did, I don't think. But, but please hear this. Regardless of your age, you're never too young or too old to be used by God. Um, our dear friend that you've heard me mention before, Lucille Andrews, by the way, she's still living. She's about 104 right now. She's still committing Scripture to memory. When we visited her, we went up to see her some months ago, and she's, she's failing health now. But... Um, this was actually the, maybe the time before that, I think, so maybe two times ago we went up to see her dear friend. And um, she, we were just talking. I said, well, I want to go ahead and tell you this, Ms. Lucille, in case you go to heaven before we do. I want to go ahead and tell you now something about thanking her for her example, and especially on Scripture memorization. She said, well, my most recent one that I memorized is, I think it was Psalm 91 or something. And uh, she said, would it be okay if I shared it with you now? And I said, oh, we'd love to. She sat right there, y'all, and went right away through that verse by verse. Still committing Scripture to memory. He or she that hideth God's Word in their heart is doing a wise thing. And so God's going to use you. Just make yourself available like I say, you're never too old to, to serve God. There might be some things we, should, we do a little differently, different things, but we're never too old to serve God. And, and the greatest thing we can ever do is to pray. He's going to use you. May none of us quit before we cross home plate. Let's be like Ms. Bertha, like Ms. Lucille Andrews, like my parents, the example they set for us, Sue's parents, whose mom's still with us, she's 90, almost 94 now, Decatur Overby, um, Betty and Ruth Graham, the Apostle Paul, and yes, more than any or anything else, Jesus, who never took his focus off pleasing the Father. Speaking of Brother Decatur, I still miss him. I remember the first funeral I did when we were with y'all was before we actually even came to start Sunday. It happened that first call. I know some of y'all, Dean and others of you remember that. But uh, it was on a Wednesday, I think it was. And uh, we had our service, going home service on Friday, I think it was. And uh, that was when I, I, some of those, I, I never got to, we had prayer for her, and I told Brother Decatur, I, I'll be, I'm going to get by and see her, see her maybe tomorrow will be okay. He's like, yeah. He came by and check on us on Wednesday. Oh, see. Tuesday, and uh, Floyd, it was Robert that came and told me and gave me the news that uh, Ms. Decatur had passed, and so you, you, just don't, you just don't ever know who's watching, who's, who's learning that example, who's seeing how you run the bases, how you listen for the coach to say go or whoa, and, and it's a, it sounds almost the same, uh, the, and, and playing the game the way it's meant to be played. But let me share with you another closing verse from uh, Psalm 90. If you want to take a look there, or I'll read it for you. If you don't, we're going to close it on out. But Psalm 90, this is actually um, a prayer from Moses. Interestingly enough, Moses actually wrote this, this psalm, and I think there were a few, a few he wrote a... He wrote a few, or God did through him. But Psalm 90, verse 12. So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. To number our days. In other words, to make the most of every single day. To ask the Lord every day, every morning. And I, I get sometimes a little slack on it. But Lord, what can I do today? Use me today to bring honor and glory to you. To make the most of this day. This won't be another wasted day for me. I want to count. I want, I want to make it work. And that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Moses uh, lived to be about 120 and I think is one of the greatest leaders who ever lived. That's another whole thing. But we're about to close out and our coach is looking squarely at you and he's looking at me 
uh, from third base? And are we looking and listening to him? The game's on the line. So let's do the most important thing any, any we can ever do, and that's to encourage each other to edify the body of Christ. Build up the body of Christ. Evangelize the lost. Exalt the Christ Savior. Just a preacher thing, having three E's there. It kind of helps me remember what I'm supposed to be doing these days. That's my mission right now. And so thank you all for the opportunity to get to be here with you. And uh, we've, we've really been looking forward to it. And uh, I appreciate Ian giving the opportunity. And let's go to the Lord in prayer, can we? Father, I thank you so much for this time together tonight, for this time to meet in your word, to fellowship in your word. I thank you, Father, for all the times just looking across the congregation. I think virtually every single one in some way or another has been such a blessing to Sue and me. And I thank you for them, Lord. They are running strong. Lord, continue to help them. Encourage them, Lord God. Just when Satan's trying to knock the life out of us, Lord, just remind us that he's, he's second. He's, he's never going to win out. Stronger and greater are you that's in us. And Lord, we, we see our country needs this, Lord. It's, it's the church, it's us. It's, the lost are the lost. They're doing what the lost do. Help us to do what you'd have us to do, and that's be salt, be light. As it were, like a city on a hill that all around could see the difference in our lives. Thank you again, Father, for what you've been doing here at Heisberg and what you're going to be doing in the months and years to come until you call us home or until you come again or however it all works out that way. Father, we know we have brothers and sisters right now in Ukraine and other places who are being persecuted beyond measure. But we pray for that you'd give them wisdom, that you'd give them an extra portion of your strength, especially the missionaries who some of them are serving incognito to be able to, to do all that they can do to help encourage the believers who are there and then be the witness to the lost who are there to see the, even in the midst of all that terrible destruction, uh, to, to experience the peace of, of you, Lord, that passeth all understanding. Father, well, I pray you'll somehow affect the mind of this Putin. Um, Lord, that you will, we realize it's not a battle of flesh and blood. It's not him. It's Satan is the real enemy. He's just simply not aware of that. But we know that. And, 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 it's, and Lord, just help us to know how we can best deal with some of these things that are facing so many people today. Not just at Ukraine but here in the States as well, Lord. And Father, you know, I have trouble sometimes praying as I should. Um, I, I do more praying against people than for them in, our, in high places, Lord. But I just pray, Father, that you would work and stir in the hearts of those that are from our president right on down. And Lord, just give them again uh, wisdom that's beyond measure. And Lord, again, thank you for this day, with this exciting time of the year. As we continue to gain momentum going into the Resurrection Sunday, just coming right around the corner, we love you and thank you. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Y'all know the little song, one of my little favorites we used to close out with was, um, In My Home, Lord Be Glorified. Let's stand and sing that little song together. Let me close. In